Just 37 seconds after liftoff, this rocket abruptly veered off course and exploded. It was the 1996 maiden flight of Ariane 5, the newest vessel designed by the European Space Agency. Thankfully, no people were on board, just four very expensive state-of-the-art satellites. The total cost of the rocket and the payload was estimated at over $370 million. What's shocking is that the cause of the explosion was soon discovered to be merely a single line of code, and the code that went wrong is surprisingly simple. This would leave us wondering how such an elementary mistake could make it past top engineers, and how we could prevent similar failures in the future. These questions would help fuel a broader movement to reimagine the status quo of how we test our computer programs, a movement that consequently helped us understand mathematical properties of coloring maps and the optimal way to stack oranges in a grocery store. Today, the same methods are used to ensure the safety of some of our most crucial software systems. But how did a single oversight blow up a $370 million rocket? In the code, there was a reading of the rocket's horizontal bias velocity, a small correction value applied to the rocket's horizontal velocity measurement. But the raw bias velocity, measured in meters per second, was being multiplied by a constant factor, likely something like 1 over 0 0.005 meters per second, to translate the reading into a normalized form. For example, a velocity reading of 100 meters per second would have been translated to something like 20,000 normalized units. The normalized reading was being stored in a 64-bit floating point number, which is a format that can represent very large and very precise values. But the software converted it into a different data type, a 16-bit signed integer. 16-bit signed integers can only represent numbers between negative 32,768 and positive 32,767. With the example we just did, the 20,000 normalized units would have fit comfortably within this range, and during Ariane 4 flights, for which the same code had successfully been in use for nearly 10 years, the conversion worked fine, as the readings never exceeded the maximum value. But on the fateful flight of Ariane 5, the horizontal bias velocity reading was too large to fit in a 16-bit integer. So the conversion failed in what's called an integer overflow. It triggered a software error, and the guidance computer shut down. There was a backup computer on board that took over, but it too ran into the exact same problem and shut down soon after, as it was running the exact same code. The main computer responsible for flying the rocket began to receive corrupted data from the failed systems, which it unfortunately attempted to interpret as real flight commands to correct its horizontal velocity. This violently tilted the trajectory off course, and immense aerodynamic stress shortly began to tear the rocket apart. Ultimately, its self-destruct system automatically triggered to prevent itself from flying into populated areas. You might be wondering how such an event could happen. There were millions of dollars being poured into testing, and yet no one caught this simple flaw. It's not like they weren't aware of this kind of error either. Integer overflow was a well-known phenomenon that any software engineer would have been quite familiar with. But on the other hand, there were many other parts of the software that could have contained fatal errors but didn't. Failing to recognize the engineering team's careful planning and diligence to keep the rest of the code error-free would be shortchanging them. It was just this one small oversight that was wrong. Unfortunately, in this case, that one small oversight was enough to cripple the whole mission. This wouldn't be the end of the story, but rather one of the defining moments in history that would push us to seriously rethink the way we go about writing and testing code. As our reliance on software for critical systems increased, it was becoming clear that simply trusting our expertise and thoroughness was not good enough. No matter how many checks were put in place for extensive testing and quality control, there would always be a small chance that one mistake got overlooked. And sometimes, that mistake could end up costing big time. To prevent disasters like this, we would need a way to reason rigorously about what a program will do before it runs. The tools for doing that were already starting to take shape decades before the Ariane 5 explosion, 
One of the most notable developments being a logical system published by mathematician Tony Hoare in 1969. The system is now called Hoare logic, and it's designed to reason about a program's behavior using a set of formal inference rules. These inference rules include cases for different programming instructions you might encounter, such as if statements, assignments to variables, etc. The inference rules allow you to prove statements of the form PCQ, where C is a command, or a programming instruction, and P and Q are states that the program could be in. The interpretation of a statement PCQ is that if a program is in state P and you run the command C, then the program will end in state Q. In other words, Hoare logic allows you to formally verify that running a command will transform the state of the program according to what you intended. One of the simplest inference rules to understand is for what's called a sequential composition, which is simply when you put two commands in sequence. This is like how when you write a semicolon after a line of code in many programming languages, it denotes a separation between two commands to be run in sequence. The symbol for sequential composition in Hoare logic is a semicolon as well. The inference rule for sequential composition is very straightforward. It says that if one command takes the program from state P to state Q, and the next command takes the program from state Q to state R, then both commands in sequence transform the program from state P to state R. For example, in our program here, we have a command that adds 1 to a variable called x, and the following command multiplies x by 2. If x equals 42 originally, then the first command would take the program from a state where x equals 42 to a state where x equals 43. And if x equals 43, then the second command would cause x to equal 86. Therefore, if x equals 42 and you run both commands in sequence, x will be equal to 86 afterwards. It just makes sense. Altogether, the set of inference rules in Hoare logic can be used to reason about and formally prove the correctness of a wide range of programs, from simple arithmetic to much more sophisticated algorithms. Now, to be clear, what we just did was an illustrative example. Hoare logic itself doesn't operate directly on real programming languages like C. It's an abstract logical framework meant to reason about programs in a simplified, idealized setting. But its development helped spark a broader movement to build rigorous tools that do apply to real languages, and that effort has been central to putting computer programming on a more solid foundation. The whole point of formal verification is essentially to check our blind spots when it comes to reasoning about software, and having tools that give us a more thorough survey of all relevant information is important not just in engineering but in everyday life, especially when it comes to the news, which is why I want to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Ground News. Ground News is a news comparison platform. They work with independent organizations to rate the bias and factuality of media outlets, helping you get a clearer view of what's really going on. For example, take this recent story about the Trump administration's attempts to cut SpaceX contracts. Coverage across the spectrum agrees on SpaceX's important role in the US government, but left-leaning sources tend to frame the situation as a feud between Donald Trump and Elon Musk, and characterize Musk as unpredictable, while sources on the right do not make this judgment. These subtleties in the way you receive information can have a massive effect on how you form opinions, and Ground News helps you see those differences more clearly, with biased distribution charts and summaries that compare narratives from different political camps. Ground News has honestly been super helpful for me to objectively process information, and I think you'll love it too. Scan this QR code or go to ground.news slash purplemind to get 40% off their Vantage plan. Big thanks to Ground News for sponsoring this video. And now, let's get back to the story. The emergence of systems like Hoare logic was a big step forward in our effort to formalize the verification of computer programs. But at the time, this effort remained mostly academic, and it wasn't until much later that formal verification would start to see more widespread use. One of the major turning points in that regard actually came from a famous result in math known as the Four-Color Theorem. 
The origin of the four color theorem dates back all the way to 1852, where an English botanist and mathematician named Francis Gothry was playing around trying to color the map of counties in England. He noticed that with the right colors used for the right counties, only four different colors were needed to ensure that no neighboring counties had the same color. For example, on this map, we only need to use red, green, blue, and yellow, and there are no two counties colored the same that border each other. But as he experimented with different maps, including real ones but also imaginary ones, Gothry soon realized that the map of England wasn't special. All of these maps could be colored with four colors such that no bordering regions share a color. Now, it was clear that three colors wasn't enough. To see this, look at France, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Germany. These countries all border each other, so you can try red, green, and blue for France, Belgium, and Germany, but Luxembourg can't be colored red, green, or blue, since it neighbors all three of the other countries. You have to use a fourth color. But Gothry became convinced that four colors is enough to color any map. That's the four color theorem. Gothry had no doubt that the four color theorem was true, but proving it would turn out to be very difficult, and he didn't know how to do it. In fact, it would take over 150 years before a valid proof was finally completed. However, until then, there were several times when we thought we had a solution, only to find out later that there was a mistake. In 1879, Alfred Kemp published what was hailed as a brilliant proof. A year later, Peter Tate gave a different one. Both were celebrated, but both were wrong, and no one realized it for over a decade until Percy Haywood found a flaw in Kemp's argument. A year later, Julius Peterson did the same to Tate's. The once again unproven theorem remained unproven for another 85 years, when Kenneth Appel and Wolfgang Hocken announced that they had solved it. As before, the mathematical community celebrated, and news of the solution spread across the world. But their proof was long and tedious, involving a computer search through thousands of cases. With a history of faulty attempts to solve this problem, there was also skepticism among many that the proof was valid, and in fact there were some claims that certain parts of their proof were incorrect. The debate would last all the way until 2005, when computer scientist Georges Gontier used a special programming language called ROC to formally verify the entire thing. ROC is a logical system that's inspired by many of the same principles as Hoare logic. It's designed to rigorously check the correctness of mathematical proofs from the ground up, and it's widely accepted that if a proof passes through ROC, it's a valid proof. Rock's foundation is in pure mathematics, but in addition to more traditional mathematical proofs, its logical framework can also be applied to check the correctness of computer programs. One of the crucial parts of the verification process for the four color theorem involved using Rock to prove that the code written by Appel and Hocken to check through thousands of cases was correct. So now the proof wasn't just computer assisted, it was computer verified. For the first time, we had a proof of the four color theorem for which no human intuition needed to be trusted, which was an impressive feat. The technical details of Appel and Hocken's proof likely would have been far too complicated for any human to intuitively understand, which underscores the importance of having these automated tools to make sure everything checks out. And the four color theorem wasn't alone. Around the same time, other famous results in math also faced skepticism over their computer-assisted proofs until they too were formally verified. Among these famous results is the Kepler conjecture, which states that the most space-efficient way to pack spheres is in this pyramid stack shape, like how you see oranges in a grocery store. A team led by Thomas Hales used a tool similar to ROC called HOL Lite to complete a formally verified proof of the Kepler conjecture in 2015 roughly 400 years after Johannes Kepler first proposed it in 1611. This came after years of controversy surrounding Hales's original 1998 proof, which relied heavily on computer calculations and was too complex for traditional peer review to fully check. 
The fact that formal verifications of such complex proofs were possible showed just how powerful these tools could be, and it would revolutionize how we think about proving things in math. But what software engineers started to take more seriously around this time was that you can do the same thing for any computer program. And that was a lot better than the current status quo, which was to prove the correctness of software by hand, if at all. Let's walk through how such a manual proof might have gone. Here's a very simple function written in C called mystery that takes one input, an integer n. Inside the function, a variable a gets assigned the value of n minus 42. Then another variable b gets assigned the value of n plus 42. Finally, we output a plus b. Okay, so doing some basic algebra, we can see that the output is going to be n minus 42 plus n plus 42. The 42s cancel, so we're left with n plus n, which is 2 times n. And so we've proven that mystery of n outputs 2 times n. Great. The only problem is this proof is wrong. Mystery of n does not always output a number equal to 2 times n. For small values of n, like 314 or 1729, mystery of n does have the effect of doubling n. But for n equals, say, 20,042, we get negative 25,452? What happened here? Well, what happened is that the function uses 16-bit signed integers, meaning it can only represent numbers between negative 32,768 and positive 32,767. When we double 20,042, mathematically it's 40,084. But inside the program, 40,084 is too big to fit in a 16-bit signed integer. So what would actually happen in the C code is the number would wrap around to the minimum 16-bit signed integer value in an integer overflow, ending up at negative 25,452. This was exactly the type of problem that made the Ariane 5 rocket explode, and if you were writing this code without a tool to formally verify correctness, you may have missed this error, just like the engineers in 1996. But with a proper verification tool, every detail of the programming environment, including how numbers are stored, how operations behave, and where overflows might occur, gets baked into the logic. So you can prove, with mathematical certainty, that a program does what you think it does, or in our case, become aware that it doesn't. Today, researchers and engineers are working to make formal verification tools more accessible and practical. However, it's still far from mainstream. For everyday software development, it's often seen as too complex, too time-consuming, or simply overkill. But as the tools become more and more usable, that's starting to change. Verified software is showing up in more and more critical places, such as CompCert, a C compiler formally verified using Rock, or Evercrypt, a formally verified cryptographic library designed for high-performance HTTPS and TLS protocols. Many government entities, such as the US Department of Defense, have also been funding programs dedicated to building high-assurance, verifiably correct software systems. On the face of it, the Ariane 5 failure was just a story about a rocket and an engineering mistake that brought it down. But digging deeper, it was a moment that revealed just how fragile our confidence in software could be, and how high the stakes really are when code goes wrong. The fact of the matter is, even simple programs can fail in surprising ways. Seemingly obvious statements, like 20,042 times 2 equals 40,084, can become dangerously incorrect when implemented carelessly in code. And the most experienced engineers can still miss subtle assumptions that cause catastrophic outcomes. We may never eliminate every bug in every piece of software, but with formal verification, we now have the tools to start building systems we can actually trust. And with that, Hopefully we won't be getting any more integer overflow errors in our rocket ships anytime soon.